quite good not being able to see everybody. It's weird. Yeah. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for everyone who is joining us today. Thank you for Jeremy so much for joining us on this final day of Fun Fashion Week. Uh, we're very happy to see an audience from all over the place. Um, it's really wonderful. I start to recognize names that we've had every day this week and, and some new friends as well coming in. Wonderful to see everyone. Uh, this uh, particular presentation is, is very special because having Jeremy as part of the I Love Typography family is, is also very special for us. Uh, we worked really hard to convince Jeremy that we are a trusted partner who Jeremy as you guys might know, does not work with distributors. So, so, so it's it's a badge of honor for us that you are with us, and um, and an even bigger sort of prize that you are presenting, you know, and releasing your new typeface as part of Fashion Week. We're really, really, really excited about that. Thank you so much for taking the time and and for being here. I uh, don't need to introduce who Jeremy Tankard is. You guys all know his work and love him as much as we do. Um, thank you so much, Jeremy. I leave it to you. I will come back when it's time for the Q and A. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right. They need to speed this process up, don't they? Okay, I want to move myself under here, and then that's reasonably less scary. So we um, only see the screen, we're not seeing anything. No, no, else. that's fine. You know, I'm just to play with the screen. Yeah, I've not okay, done these ones excellent. before. Anyway, so here we go. Yes, excellent. Thank you for joining. It's a great to be part of this excellent new venture to share with you some of the ideas that shaped the new type I'm introducing. Now, time is short, and I've tried to keep this reasonably concise, but I suspect I failed on that account. And I make no apologies for any technical stuff that may and will hit you along the way. Anyway, the modern graphic designer is tech savvy, so it all should be fine, we hope. Over the years, I've sat in front of many screens. From my early years uh, using various Sinclair computers, through entering typesetting code on Bertold image setters, to seeing a wireframe uh, rendition of type on a larger Thedes computer, and of course all the Macs from the beige box of an SE30 to the slick iMac we have now. Lots of different ways of seeing or perceiving computer-based letters. It's worth uh, bearing in mind that we have so much freedom to design what we want now, that we forget the technical constraints and innovations that type designers face to get to where we are today. Having brought you up very briefly, uh, up to date with my life in front of screens, how does this historical experience filter its way into the design of rock hopper? Well, uh, the day to day of sitting in front of my spangly 5K screen with its super sharp detail and intense deep color has allowed me to appreciate just how eye wateringly sharp type appears now the effect of which is further compounded through back illumination. Those that know me, and I saw Nick pop up on, up, uh, on the chat, will know that I like to have my brightness set up quite low, especially on the phone, to uh, reduce this aggressive eye-watering glare. Anyway, seeing this sharpness did prompt me to consider designing a type which uses the technology available to try and avoid this assault on the eyes. I consider uh, the rounded stands a result of applied processes and different processes leave their mark in different ways. I know that these aren't uh, sans letters, but to stop my thinking off, I was keen to look at various approaches which help make a type image soft and to try and understand where the cuddly look came from. For instance, the approach to lettering seen here uh, from Joseph Crawhall's chapbook of 1883. These could quite easily have given rise to the style used by Begastaff brothers on their posters a decade later. Their wonky shaping aims to evoke a naive and warm appearance. Another decade later, and this style is knocked into shape to become printing types such as Windsor. The chunky soft style was also used by Oz Cooper in his hand lettering, which eventually became the classic Cooper Black, fully pumped with plumpness and rounded goodness. But beyond printing, there are cast letters, and these show a wide range of effects, which soften and even destroy the outline, such as defects in casting, the wearing away of the image over time, and the visual softening and blurring through overpainting. 
Also, in addition to this, is the importance of light and how light is required to make a form visible, especially in glass. A routing tool will spin in order to cut a letter. This leaves behind the Markovitz process. In these two uh, routed out letters, the internal junctions are round. As a process, it's controlled to some extent, uh, which makes the letters more uniform, more mechanical, more structured, even though they're quite ugly. Another effect that causes softening is halation. Here, lighting can drastically affect the performance of a letter. Back illumination will cause the image to spread and blur. You get the idea. There are a lot of situations that result in altering the final image of a letter. However, on screen, there's only light. And of course, with digital type, there is no degradation through wear. So the question is, how can the digital environment be used to create the illusion found in a physical one? Wanting to make any idea work is to the best of its ability is obvious. And with a bit of clear thinking, you can usually circumnavigate potential issues. The vision for this typeface required the outline to be smoothly, uh, to be continuously smooth and any rounded features flow seam seamlessly together. The big problem in digital type is how to smoothly join a curve to a straight and avoid an optical bump. This image is reproduced from type designer uh, Albert Yampool's 2010 article in number 42 of Typo magazine. It highlights the area of concern, the awkward bump. Part of the solution is to increase the grid that the typeface is designed on. Usually a font is produced on a thousand unit grid, typographically referred to as a thousand M square, which is the standard for postscript type. There is no reason for this now, so I increased the grid to 2048 which historically is the preferred resolution for true type design. As our modern screens can handle such high detail, why not take advantage of this and design for it? This increase in resolution allowed me to maintain subtle details such as shallow curves. In fact, there are no straight lines in rock hopper. Using shallow curves instead of straight lines helps with the optical bump problem as it avoids joining a straight line to a curve. All the stems swell from a smaller amount in the lightest weights to a little more expressive plumpness at the heavy end, which also gives a positive side effect of the swell is um, the added illusion of softness. To add a bit of tension and snap back so it's not all soft and cuddly, all the junctions where strokes meet are kept sharp. The lettering on this uh, brass plate shows a similar sharp junction uh, internal detail. A lot of this is uh, technical, and happens behind the scenes to help create an illusion. But the actual letter shape itself can also imply a softness. Uh, letters are very adaptable and some shapes are naturally softer than others. Rock copper adopts uh, the simpler and rounded versions of A and G. And in the italic, the softer, more fluid uh, flowing forms for E, K, V, W are used. Now, I have a quick drink here. I've sort of been, I have talked about this as being two typefaces in one. And this is now the start of the other bit. I always like to push for more. As you've seen in some of the earlier images, changes are made to a letter's outline through overpainting, where and such like. This often creates interesting and ambiguous letters, which actually remain readable. You can make out in these images here, um, obviously brick how uh, they're disfigured, uh, where you're in the top image, they're filling in. And in the other brass plate down here, they're just crazy, but you can still read it. This disfiguration doesn't occur in the digital, where everything is a constant sameness, anticipated and devoid of random character. So was there a way to push rock hopper in this direction somehow? Several years back, I had the idea of creating a set of elements that could be applied to a typeface. And this page is actually taken from 20, 2007, a trilogy sketchbook. So it's quite some time back. These, uh, these, this idea was that um, elements would sit um, against letter stems to add a certain amount of arbitrary decoration, but without altering the base letter shape. It would have been a collection of non-spacing elements able to be inserted into any type. That was the intention. The idea remained lurking at the back of my mind, um, but managed to creep to the front as I was developing rock hopper. 
and the organic and exuberant forms of Art Nouveau helped to visualize this idea, such as these rather wild initials designed by Henry Vandervelt in 1896. So uh, it, uh, tentative generic elements now became soft organic swashes with the intention to not just add one swash to a letter, but any number of them. Uh, the tracing paper drawing on the right shows a cap H with three swashes layered on top. Adding more and more swashes to a letter allowed me to embellish not only its shape, but disfigure neighboring ones as well, where they would bump in and cross and obliterate. Making this idea usable through today's technology was not without issues. I borrowed the concept of anchors. This process is used in type design to place accents over a base letter in order to support uh, different language requirements. This image shows the idea. The anchor is uh, the diamond next to the word top. It's called top because it's at the top of the letter. This example shows just four accents, tilde, acute, grave, and circumflex, all grouped together in what is referred to as an anchor cloud. Each individual accent also has an anchor called top. The idea is that both anchors are snapped and brought together to form the final accented letter, such as N tilde. Developing this idea, I added 14 special anchors, allowing a range of swashes to be attached and so form a swash cloud. From uh, the swash cloud, one, two, or various combinations of swashes can be turned on, even all of them in a feature I've called overkill. And this just walks through how varieties of swashes can be turned on to the left, one, two, three, round the character, to the right, one, two, three, or all of them. When in use, happy accidents occur where swashes clash with each other as well as with neighboring characters, all of which creates a vibrant and unique visual texture. And apart from all that, the count set is pretty extensive and includes capitals, lowercase, small caps, superiors, lots of number sets, and of course, are quite a few swashes, well over 4,000. A core part of the design of Rock Hopper is that the type image on the screen is controlled by light, which made me think about printing with light, be that the white of the screen or the intense deep liquid color of RGB shining through black. This became the basis for the specimen, which the following images are from. Uh, they cycle through various weights and degrees of excess. And it's the swashes that gave rise to the typeface name after a penguin with a nifty hairdo. And that's it, I managed to speed through it. So now you've got thousands of questions, one would hope. Amazing, uh, thank you so much. This is, uh, yeah, crazy <laughs> and brilliant. Like people are supplying the adjectives already in the chat. This is really, really cool. <laughs> Good. Uh, excellent. Um, we have already, a so just a reminder for the audience, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, if you want to like make comments along the way, uh, you can use the chat. If you want to send hearts and thumbs up and what else through the reactions, you can also do that. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, just please put your questions in the Q&A so I can easily find them. Um, so there's a question from Robert. Did you get help by a new font editor technologies to round and soften the strokes or did you make the softness by yourself everywhere? Um, say again, did I make the uh, Did you, did you use the software? Like, did you use the Oh, no, 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 no. Did you I, draw um, it yourself? Oh, it's all drawn. No, no, I, I, the way I work is, um, I have a sketchbook, an A5, so each typeface is, starts in the, in the, uh, a black sketchbook. Um, the ideas come that way, some of the, the drawings, and then from the rough notes, I then progress those onto A4 sheets, usually just thousands of things put together, then tracing paper drawings, which are more formal. And eventually I'll, um, I'll once it's sort of 
reach a point when I'm sort of biting the bits to start going, I will then go onto screen. So it's usually lodged in here, the shapes I want. But interestingly, I was, I asked them, uh, a few um, colleagues, what the pitfalls are, like Albert Yampool, what the pitfalls are with them, um, with, with trying to get rid of that optical bump from, from the join. And when he was working on it, he told me he, he worked on 2000, purely 2000, because they wanted it twice up from the 1000. So I just stuck with the 2048. And increasing that allowed me to, um, to get better control of the points and then inserting other points around. And it's just, it was jiggling. There's lots of jiggling. And um, some, some of the, there's some plugins in Glitch which are very good at maintaining um, uh, commonality uh, um, across the blend to make sure yeah. things don't nick. Um, yeah. Another idea was I was going to actually do it all in true type so you haven't got the problems of like, having postscript, but th that was just slightly um, too much to cope with. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because you would have had to edit through type curves as well. Yes, well, I'd run it in oh postscript, turned it, yeah. and then okay. corrected it, which is what I Correct. did for um, Corbel for Microsoft years ago. Yeah. And I had to deliver yeah. it one way. Okay, wow. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, well. So no, it's not software generated, so each curve is, is its own thing. But I did want them to be that, that whole idea of the mechanical as opposed to being purely soft and cuddly. So it is more structured than other types. Which I find that tends to be the way with sans serif anyway. I find them more structured than a serif. And mm. with um, rock hopper, I wanted it to be um, quite uh, methodical running through. Yeah, yeah. So it's round, but it's not organic. So there is that sense of mechanical turn of the curve rather um, than an organic flow where things are all over. Yeah, the it's, it's it's systematic. It's not in control. Yeah. Yeah. Well, until you get the swashes. Yeah. Yeah, then it goes crazy. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, there's a question from Dominic and um, says, interesting work. What sort of sectors, projects do you see this being used for? Ah, now then. Um, what's my analogy on this one? My daughter started school and the principal made a big speech to the parents and they said a lot of the um, students as they leave or eventually when they're doing their careers, will be working in, um, in will have careers and jobs that don't exist at the moment. So their yeah. potential is to equip them with um, the ability to get on in life and do things. So throw that back, I would say it's, it's up to the designers now, the, the, you know, the, um, the potential of the designer to go play and create the use. Mm -hmm. Move away from cool. Helvetica. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can live with that. <laughs> um, Ryan Hughes says, my dear, we, and hi, Ryan. <laughs> um, excellent. Uh, we have a question from Antonia. Have you ever thought to put your typeface on the blockchain and sell it as an NFT? Um, no, because my brain can't understand that. So yes, I'm quite poo bear on understanding. Uh, it's, <laughs> certain things are beyond me. If I can't see it and touch it and, and get my head around it, then I have to wait. So someone's got to give me lots of beer, I think, to, to get yeah. me up to speed. I, I get the feeling as well that we need to have like a, a wider conversation amongst web designers about the NFTs and uh, what does it mean? Like I, I know from ILT, we've, we've at least raised the flag, like guys, if you want to allow the typeface to be used in an NFT or not, you need to put this in your EULA because it does affect the usage of the typeface. Uh, but but then as the owner of the intellectual property, you have the option obviously to decide to create these, what, what they call the non-fungible non tokens where basically you create the graphic and for some reason people pay a lot of money for it. Um, I don't understand why we need to do these things, but it seems people are making ridiculous amounts. Yeah. And, so and I, I had a conversation yeah, with I, I, I have my doubts, but yeah. Yeah, there's a fellow dog walker trying to explain it to me. And I didn't get very far. I just had to sort the dog out. So um, yeah, so yeah. more yeah, the time. I, for me, spent. it just feels like it's inflated value because at the end of the day, it's it, it, it's a virtual GIF or graphic or whatever it is that doesn't, it, it's not like it's a painting you can put on a wall, you know, it's just, so it, there might be places where it is interesting and, and maybe you want to preserve that level of ownership, but. I don't know. I, I have my doubts as well. I, it just feels like we need to sit together and talk more. I, I also have concerns about the like ecological footprint of 
blockchain in general and and living so much you know uh th- there is the question of the carbon footprint of mm-hmm. such you know technologies and and industries that we need to we need to look at um yes when it's on the blockchain antonia it protects the artist when artists you sold the artist gets credit and payment for the art as well and ah, for sure it's here and says hi jeremy cool cool okay excellent good um there is a question from uh ryan uh does this mean you'll be doing your version of cooper black soon seems to be no. a milestone on every funk designer's trajectory like the musicians cover well, version like helvetica is no <laughs> <laughs> no okay <laughs> good decisive answer um moving on yes yes uh, and a question from ryan uh did you carry your uh, when he says subs does that mean superiors the yes. superior yes subs is superior well, okay, he's speaking good. feature code now you see you're very advanced Oh, okay, okay, yeah, cool. Ah, subs is the uh, the the for code uh, for superior. Okay, well, I do Arabic. We don't have superiors in Arabic, so <laughs> I've never had to Yet. make that feature. <laughs> well, yeah, no, yes. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, did you train them? Of course, yes, everything's turned. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. Cool. Swatches okay. aren't turned. Um, they don't need to be turned. Yeah. Uh, there's another question from Gotham. Um, what happens when a designer designs one or more alphabets that look the same as in other typefaces? How aware could the designer be? Also, so much awareness ruins the brainstorming. So, so basically, there is that dilemma where you need to know what other people have done so you don't replicate. But if you know too much of what other people have done, it almost seems to influence or over-influence. Where do you find that balance? And how, how, how do you navigate such a space? Um. trying to work out how would uh, I suppose I um I don't look to um do my version of exi- of an existing type so it's more something crops up um an idea from some time back and then that will manifest itself um into something else we're just looking and reacting to things um if it's if there's danger for me if there's danger of it looking like something else then i'll just stop because there's no point it's already done mm-hmm. I and mean, if i'm going to be developing it for a year or so then i don't want to be bored you know there's no point doing something so i've got to challenge myself um and i'll always look to see push more ask questions about where can something go how else can it be different what what will keep me me interested in when i'm designing it so it's um it's a yeah it's a tricky one if it this is no point doing something that already exists absolutely and just a follow up question for me because i know you generally take a little bit more time than other designers to to release that faces in general like if i face like this one how much how much time did you spend well, you forced me to finish it quickly um, yes <laughs> uh, it would have been destined for july um okay. the it's Well, I never know when a type sort of starts because they cross over, so ideas yeah. will creep up. Um, but I, I started it. I was working on um, corporate work that reached a point when I could then focus more on on this. So that was probably about September time. And I think when the early ideas were creeping in, um, then to exploring it, and I had the ideas of, of wanting to do the attachments and the sources. Uh, in quite an exploitative way that's when i put a question upon uh, on the glyph forum to see how could it be done cleverly using mark to base coding as opposed to um, having to build all the swashes um and toshi came back and said well we can do a little test so he, he did a test and it all seemed fine so i thought okay fine now i need to go and design it so there's no point just doing swashes so um and in order to define what they're going to look like when it came i think january time february time and i said to him right i'm ready now and he's going to happy to help so he did some more tests and it became then it became obvious that it just wasn't going to work because the tech wouldn't allow you to insert um curses in or fight or word word breaks it was just messy so the the option was he happily he, he gave me some script to um manage this anchor cloud and control that um and then it yeah and it was just pumping through recipes trying to build the whole thing yeah and then weeding out all the errors which is yeah joy yes <laughs> the joy of type design the 80 the 2080 rule right um mm. so we are running out of time so i'm just going to run super quickly uh nick cook says a uh, nice one Ryan. um yes so i guess to the previous question um joe graham is uh, making a merchandising suggestion baseball cap with rock hopper mohawk hair on top um <laughs> then nick the is, is, yeah. 
Yeah, Nick is asking, are the swashes a stylistic set or, uh, and if so, what are they named? Like, um, how did you put them in? Oh, they're all, all well, I use two sizing sets generally in my type. So mm -hmm. the first number one is um, fractions or whatever. Uh, number two is the alternate fractions. I think I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Well, all 18 are used, um, okay. of which the stylistic 20 is the overkill one where everything gets turned on. And that's okay. mainly for um, it's like initials, um, um, quite ornate stuff. Um, and then there's a swash feature used and stylistic alternates is used in combination if you haven't got stylistic sets. And of course, you've got the glyph palette, which is just crazy because it goes on forever. Yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. Um, and then, um, so Robert's question is already answered. He's asking if there are stylistic alternates, and we've, we've already gone through that. And how many do you, how do you decide how many to put in? To put in? How many what? Uh, stylistic sets. Well, I mean, we're limited to 22, yeah. <laughs> we're limited to 20, so yeah, we can't do any more. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, it, it was going to be done in, in a clever way, so you could have gone around the cloud and turned on one, then two, then three, and you as a designer could choose it. But um, that, wasn't, that just didn't work, and it would have been a nightmare, I think, asking far too much for designers to, to yeah. understand. It's bad enough trying to understand the open type palette, let alone yeah. the... Um, yeah. yeah, I, I, I see that typeface is really cool for sports merchandising. Uh, there, there is that sort of energy in it, that informality, uh, or maybe like um, uh, a sports team as well. Right. Well, it'll work uh, in two levels, because obviously on, on the pure, just a typeface level, it's um, it does one job. And then yeah. on the other side, it, it can go to town. Yeah, exactly. But that's the thing. When you want to, like, going back to the baseball cap, like, imagine if it's a baseball team, and then you have the crazy version for the fans who are, like, you know, mm. going crazy on them and, and being loud, right? <laughs> and so you have the normal branding for the for, for the team, but then you would have those, you know, the crazy supporters who want to be super loud and, and cheering. So then you go for the super loud uh, alternates. But um, yeah, amazing. We, we we are running out of time. We have to go to the next That's presentation fine. now. But this, this was brilliant. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, thank you for everyone who joined us today. Um, this will be, uh, this is recorded, so it will be on our YouTube channel quite shortly. Um, and so thank you so much, Bravo, and congratulations on the new typeface. And thank you again thank you. for presenting today. Thank you. Take care. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Ah, wait, wait, wait. Before we forget, we forget to say. So for 20 people, there is a 20% disc. Oh, I had to convince Jeremy to do this. Jeremy doesn't normally oh, no, like sorry. these kinds of things. But for 20 people, you get 20% off for the next week. So go quickly because this will never happen again. So <laughs> <laughs> like go now, go get the phones now. <laughs> anyway, okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.